the paranormal event of the year is back. 40 years of taking the strange seriously, it is ASAP's 40th anniversary and it takes place at the University of Bath on the weekend of September the 3rd and 4th. It's a packed weekend of speakers, guests and live presentations, researchers and academics on the pulse of the unusual, covering the broad reach of topics under the banner of the weird and wonderful, prepared to be engaged, informed and inspired. Feel free to try your hand at the annual Paranormal Olympics, share coffee and conversation with speakers in an informal environment, meet like-minded people and celebrate ASAP's 40th anniversary. It's £20 for each day or £34.99 to cover both days. The whole weekend can be included for one simple price of £34.99 at the University of Bath, ASAP 40. Book now. is Brian Hoggard and the talk title will be about horse skulls. Um, now Brian's been studying history, archaeology and folk beliefs since his teens. His undergraduate dissertation focused on folk beliefs and witchcraft where he noticed there was a huge amount of work which could be done to further explore the archaeology of witchcraft. At that point back in 1999 his research really escalated into a major project which has culminated in the publication of Magic House Protection the Archaeology of Counter Witchcraft, published by Bergen in 2019. And he's put a link here as well, which you can look at to buy his book, um, which I will put down in the questions and comments section later. As usual, do um, think of any questions you might have during this, I'm sure what's going to be a fascinating talk, and we can put them to Brian towards the end. Um, so thank you, Brian. We're all looking forward to it. And um, off you go. I'm going to be talking about... Um horse skulls and their use in magic but particularly how they appear in the archaeological record really and just some sort of thoughts and theories about how they're used. Um, I know that anybody who was at the Hidden Charms 3 conference would have heard me talk about this already um, <clears throat> and this is um, a very similar paper but I've got a bit more time today so I might waffle on a bit more which is good. So um I'm sure many of you are already aware that there have been many discoveries of these horse skulls um, beneath the floors of buildings and also some in roofs, believe it or not. And that this appears to be part of one of, well, one of the practices of protecting buildings from perceived sources of evil, um, along with things like um, witch bottles, concealed shoes, dried cats and all the different kinds of marks that you can find on and inside buildings. Um, so the horse, um, the horse skull sort of concealments in their current form are traceable definitely up to the 14th century. Okay, back to the 14th century, I mean. Um, like you, anybody here who has any sort of knowledge of prehistoric archaeology will know that you have horse burials, which are much more complete, you know, that the entire animal buried with um, sort of chariots and all sorts of warriors and things like that. But the practice that I'm talking about is where specifically just the skull is concealed in part of the building. Um, it's a bit different to, um, well, a bit different to those ones where you get the whole horse, basically. And of course, we also have um, really good testimony um, about, from folklorists, um, about this practice continuing well into the 19th century as well, um, possibly even to the turn of the 20th. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are quite a few examples of this from the 20th century as well. Um, the horse features in lots of folk traditions, um, aside from these archaeological incidences, so things like the Mary Lewid and other traditions, um, the horse is very much at the heart of lots of these traditions. And so in this paper, I'm going to be talking about the archaeological stuff, but I'm also going to be looking at this sort of some of the evidence of folklore and the connections that we can make there to try and understand this practice a bit more. <clears throat> Excuse me. And normally, um, I'll just point out, normally I work from uh, bits of paper with my notes on, but uh, our printer has completely run out of ink, so I've got it on a, on a separate screen now, which is a little bit more awkward than usual, because it's a tiny, tiny laptop. Right, so <clears throat> investigations into the meaning of concealed horse skulls um, really didn't really start until about the middle of the 20th century. I mean, there were people who had some ideas about it, but, um, but serious research didn't really start until around the 1940s or 40s and 50s. Um, and... Basically, there were two main theories which um, people were proposing. 
Um, one is what I call the acoustic theory, and the other is the foundation sacrifice theory. And they're, they're fairly self-explanatory, well, the foundation sacrifice theory is fairly self-explanatory, which is that people thought that these horse skulls were actually kind of like an offering to the building or to the spirit of place, the genius loci, um, so that maybe um, it would prevent like a kind of sacrifice, you know, so that that building would not then fall down on the person and kill them. Um, you know, and things like that, or that the spirit of place would not cause bad luck to the person. And then this acoustic theory is um, a little a little more different. Um, this is where people thought that the acoustic properties of the horse skull being concealed in the property could actually enhance sounds that were made in the property. Sounds like dancing and making music. <clears throat> so as far as I know, there's been very little scientific research into the acoustic properties of the horse skull. Um, and certainly um, I haven't done very much of that myself, but um, my, my, my feeling about that, that particular reasoning for why a horse skull would be in a property is that actually it was kind of like an excuse that people used to explain away the presence of these big horse skulls in their houses. So, um, so if you imagine you've got this great big horse skull that's been found inside your house and people say, what on earth are you doing with that? Um, well, I'm obviously just trying to improve the acoustics of my property and nothing more, Your Honour. You know, it's, it's basically a way of not getting into trouble with your local priest or raising suspicion amongst your neighbours. Um, so in England, the evidence so far is that there are 54 fines. Well, there's actually slightly more than that now, but at the time when I first wrote this paper, there were 54 fines of concealed horse skulls and what appear to be ritually used animal bones. Um, that have been reported so far from England. Um, and one of the most famous examples occurs in Ralph Merrifield's book on the archaeology of ritual and magic, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And um, basically there was an inn in Herefordshire called the Portway at Staunton on Wye. And 24 horse skulls were found screwed to the underside of the floor. And the reason given for these uh, all these horse skulls there was that it made the fiddle go better. So it basically improved the sound of the music that was made in the church. And interestingly, at Peter Church, which is a nearby village to uh, Staunton on Wye, there was a big hall associated with a manor house, and they found a similar number of horse skulls under the floor in that one as well. Um, and another example, uh, Elsdon Church in Northumberland, so right at the opposite end of the country, um, a box in the bell turret at the church there was found, which contained three horse skulls, and that was found in 1837. And, um, and that led me to think, you know, maybe there was some association between one of the functions of the church bells, which was to scare away spirits, to make it safe for people to come to church to worship. You know, maybe people thought that the horse skull had similar roles, basically, and that it was being used in that way. Um, and so that's just a couple of examples. But then uh, there's a really good example. I don't know if any of you here is familiar with Enid Porter's Cambridgeshire Customs and Folklore, which is a really thick and excellent folkloric study of the county of Cambridgeshire. Cambridgeshire, uh, that was written in 1969. And in that, there's a brilliant reference about builders practices and horse skulls on page 181, which I'm just gonna read to you because it's such a powerful bit of testimony in my opinion. So um, the quote goes along the lines of, W.H. Barrett recalls that his uncle, a builder, secured the contract in 1897 for erecting a primitive Methodist chapel at Black Horse Drove. One day he sent his nephew, then aged six, with his elder brother to the knacker's yard to buy a horse's head. When the two boys returned to it, returned um, with it, they watched the workmen dig the trench for the foundations and then saw their uncle carefully mark the centre of the site by driving into the ground a wooden stake. The men gathered around while the uncle uncorked a bottle of beer and the horse's head was placed in the bottom of the trench. The first glass of liquor poured from the bottle was thrown onto it and when the rest of the beer had been drunk, the men shoveled bricks and mortar on top of the head. It was explained to W.H. Barrett that this was an old heathen custom to drive evil and witchcraft away. Brian, Brian, sorry, massive apologies for interrupting. There's sorry. some people just saying on the there's some people saying on the chat that they're still seeing the title slide. Is that correct? That is, is that correct. What... Yeah, I haven't changed it yet. <laughs> I apologize. Perfect. Okay. No, I was just checking because a few people that go ahead. Sorry about that. Thank you. That's all right. I'll change it to a more interesting picture of a horse skull. There we go. Oh wow! Thanks. <laughs> Carry on. Okay. So, um, so the, the, there are more. This, this unfortunately is not a, a terribly picture-rich um, presentation, but there are more towards the end. Um, but anyway, so, so that that quote uh, clearly shows um, a, a living tradition in 1897 
of including a horse's head in the foundations and very specifically um, links it with driving evil and witchcraft away. And, um, <clears throat> and in fact, that phrase, driving evil and witchcraft away, is actually used in quite a lot of the written charms that are written at the same time as well. So it's, so it's clearly a, a phrase um, that was important to people and horse skulls played an important role in that. Um, so the horse skull you can see on screen at the moment is my own horse skull, which I actually bought from a, an antiques uh, dealer in Suffolk. And it was already a hundred years old, I believe, when I bought it. Um, so I did not contribute to the death of this horse as far as I'm aware. And, uh, and it wasn't recovered from a concealed uh, context at all. This is the horse skull of a male horse. And it sits above my bookshelf behind me, actually, all the time. So, you know, my, this room is well protected in more than one way, but that's one of them. Um, so here's another, another picture. This is the, um, the horse skulls in Elsdon in Northumberland that I was telling you about. These are the three horse skulls that were found actually in a box in the bell turret in Northumberland. And they've now been, uh, for, for a long time, they weren't on display, but, you know, fairly recently, I'm sure you can tell why the, the display looks very new, of course, but um, they did fairly recently decide to put the horse skulls on display. And so you can go and see them now. Um, I'll thank Mark Hatton for this picture. It wasn't, uh, I haven't actually visited this site yet. Um, but it's lovely that they're on display in the church and that they're incorporating the folklore about them in the church. And then here are some examples from Wales, okay, from Cardiganshire. So um, in Wales, there's been one person who's done a lot of research on horse girls in Wales, and his name is Eurwin William. And um, he published a really good paper in 2000, um, which was basically a study of horse girls in Wales. Lots of extremely good examples. And he, he found that um, pretty much every sort of, you know, 19th century chapel had, a, you know, a tale or a legend of bones beneath it. And certainly in most of the ones that have been excavated or knocked down or replaced, they have found horse skulls or in some cases, sort of big, large animal humeruses and things like that. So it's very much a tradition in the Welsh uh, building tradition of concealing these horse skulls as well as they were in Cambridgeshire. And I would say that um, this really, this practice of concealing horse, horses' heads and horse skulls in buildings was really the norm in the building tradition um, in the 19th century most definitely in chapels, because the example in Cambridgeshire was from a chapel, and Ewan found many examples in Wales from chapels as well. So uh, one of the examples that he mentioned was from a chapel at Breckfa in Breckenshire, uh, where several horse skulls were found in the ceiling, which is a very quite unusual place to find them. And which also leads me to one of the, uh, one of the considerations about the idea of foundation sacrifice because when you find um, a horse skull within the structure of the building, higher up than the foundations, it's not really a foundation sacrifice, is it? It's a different kind of, different kind of magic. It's in a, an addition to the building and it must be performing a slightly different role because it's not been set sort of deep in the earth. Um, so anyway, we'll talk more about that in a little while. Um, one of his other examples was um, from 1827 where four, four horse skulls were found buried in, found in the foundations of a Calvinist chapel. So again, you know, when it's when it is in the foundations, you've got a case for it being a foundation sacrifice. But then we look at that account that we had from Cambridgeshire earlier on, and they did exactly the same thing and said it was to drive away evil and witchcraft. So what I'm trying to sort of say here is there's these two um, basic ideas from the middle of the 20th century, the one of foundation sacrifice and the acoustic theory. There's more to it than that. It's not as simple as just saying it's a foundation sacrifice, because clearly there was a belief about it driving away evil and witchcraft but also it has lots of similarities with foundation sacrifice. Um, another quite impressive example that Eurwin uh, cites is from Llandaff Cathedral, where horse skulls were found embedded in the choir stalls in the 1930s. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever handled a horse skull. I'm sure some of you have. If you've ever seen the Murray Lewis or something, you will have a good idea of the size of a horse skull. But to accommodate a horse skull within choir stalls, you know, that, that's... The carpenter is going to have to think about that quite a bit um, and everybody's going to have to know it's occurring because you can't really hide a horse skull very well at all especially if there are several of them yeah and so um ewan also talks about some uh, that were found you know some others that were found in roofs in wales as well which again is this more structural way of concealing a horse skull and he was very much of the opinion that many of these skulls were there to protect against evil and witchcraft as well 
and he heard folklore as well, where people used the term that uh, horse skulls and roofs were thought to dispel the spirits, which again is, a, is an interesting idea. Um, in Ireland, there was a huge amount of research around 1945 as well. Um, Sean O'Sullivan, who was a prominent member of the Society of Antiquaries of Ireland, um, decided after hearing lots of reports of horse skulls from sort of, you know, peasant cottages in Ireland, that there was, you know, some interesting work to be done there. And he decided to conduct this really big survey. So he asked all his colleagues within the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland to go out to their various localities and inquire about horse skulls um, amongst these little cottages that existed all over the place. And uh, many of them said they had horse skulls underneath the flagstone right in front of the fireplace. And, um, and when they were asked, you know, what is the reason for you to do this? They said that it made the dancing sound better in the evenings because obviously people would gather around the fire and they'd do family entertainments and they said it sounded better. Um, now, uh, Sean O'Sullivan, he very much did not um, believe this acoustic explanation. He thought that, um, again, this was kind of uh, people coming up with an excuse for why there was a horse skull in their house that wouldn't get them into trouble. And um, he was of the opinion, like, like I am, that essentially this excuse was repeated so often that it actually became the received wisdom that this is, this is why it was happening. Um, and also, I mean, I would point out that, you know, as I said earlier, I've got this horse skull up there behind me and I am um, a musician as well. And I've never noticed any discernible improvement when I've got a horse skull around, otherwise I'd take one to all my gigs. But, um, but you know, the thing is, maybe the horse skull, when it's attached to a timber, it can resonate, maybe it can. But, but again, you know, when we, when we consider that, we also have to consider that an awful lot of horse skulls were found set into the earth and weren't in a situation where they could resonate or transmit acoustic vibrations in that way. And anyway, Sullivan, he concluded his paper in this way. He said, it can hardly be doubted that the now popular explanation of the burial of horse skulls under the floors of houses, churches, castles, or bridges to produce an echo is a secondary one. It may indeed be a practical explanation, but a little consideration of the problem must inevitably lead to the conclusion that this custom is but another link in the chain of evidence regarding foundation sacrifices. So he was very much of the foundation sacrifice kind of uh, strand. And, um, you know, I think that uh, there is um, an element of the foundation sacrifice belief in the practice of concealing horse skulls. But I think that people thought that horses had more magic about them that made it, a, you know, Kind of not just a foundation sacrifice it was more than that and we'll explore that i hope as we go along and um you know the custom of concealing horse skulls um con continued in ireland well into the 19th century um, an example uh, in armagh uh, where um some folklore was collected that says the frontal bones of a horse's head were regarded as being particularly sonsy which apparently is a colloquial term for lucky and they were often buried in barn floors and under the thresholds of dwelling houses for this reason. And so again, in the 19th century, we've got this idea that it's luck and um, good fortune is what will come if you bring a horse skull rather than uh, specifically warding off evil. But again, you know, by the 19th century, certain people, their beliefs might have changed slightly and, and you know, the memory of why they were put inside buildings might have changed slightly over time. Um, in Scotland, uh, there is um, a horse skull reported from under an Edinburgh meeting house, you know, so again, that's a 19th century building, and another was reportedly found in one of the city bridges in Edinburgh as well. In Scotland, we also find um, the skulls of deer occasionally in fireplaces and places like that. Now, the practice also occurs um, elsewhere in the world. It's not just the British Isles, so there's an awful lot reported from uh, Scandinavia. And in fact, one of the main studies on horse skulls um, did come from Scandinavia, from Sweden in particular, um, a chap called Albert Sandcliffe in 1949. He did a lot of work on horse skulls and he put, in particular did work on threshing barns. And because he was getting these reports that horse skulls were being found beneath threshing barns. And when he saw some of them and he was asking what was the reason for them being buried there, people were giving him this acoustic um, theory again. They were essentially saying that the, the sound of the threshing was enhanced by the presence of the horse skulls. And they talked about singing flails. And, and it was kind of like this idea that maybe 
the neighboring farms thought that you had more grain to thresh um, or that you were busier than the other farms. And this was kind of along the lines that he was, he was going down with his research. And although he kind of accepted the explanations he was given, he didn't really question them that much. He did say in his conclusion that he did accept that there could be a more ancient explanation that's different and this might have been a more a more recent evolution in the belief about why they were there. Um, we also have um, people like uh, my colleague and friend Sonia Hukan Taival from Finland, who's spoken at two of my Hidden Chums conferences. She's a really interesting lady. Um, she's found many examples in Finland as well, which can be found in fireplaces and also walls. And she thinks that, um, that actually, you know, in one of her papers, she says that basically she thinks that the practice is really common and that because it's so common, people just don't report it. So they've got some examples in Finland on record, but she thinks there are huge amounts more and people just don't think that they're important enough to, to report. Um, and I was talking about Albert and his um, uh, talking, his research that focused on threshing barns, but, um, and this acoustic theory that he was presented with, but the, there is an example, a fairly recent case study that was discovered in a little village called Fru Alstad in Sweden, where um, four horse skulls have been placed beneath the, the four corners of a house. And they weren't in a position where they could resonate or um, conduct acoustic waves. They weren't attached to any timbers or anything. They were just under the four corners, which to me looks very much like um, a protective arrangement. Um, and, you know, but you could also say that that could be a case for foundation sacrifice. But, but you know, having it at the four cardinal points of a building, that looks to me like a deliberate act of protection. Um, looking at other examples, um, in Russia, I was uh, a colleague of mine called Ioana Ripchuch from Romania. She visited um, the uh, Ethnographic Museum in St. Petersburg. Uh, and she said that they've got a tableau in that museum where there's a horse skull set up, sort of braced by some wood next to a beehive. And that there was a tradition of having horse skulls um, in beehive areas, basically, because they would protect the beehives and the honey from evil, um, which is, again, um, similar belief, this idea that horse skulls protect against evil. But in that case, they were very, very much on display. And then um, another friend from Romania, um, Adina Hulubash, who works for the Romania Academy, actually, Romanian Academy. She told me that horse skulls are often placed in orchards in Romania to ward off evil as well. And uh, to add to this, you know, across the pond in America, there are quite a lot of examples. And um, this tradition seems to have been taken over there. And um, some of the buildings where they've been found were built by Finnish people, and some of them were built by English people. Um, but anyway, there's an, an example um, where four horse skulls were found beneath the Jarrett Mansion, which is at the Cahokia Courthouse Historic State Site. And one was in a cavity right beside the fireplace and the others were under the floor. So again, you know, not specifically in the foundations of the building within the structure. And also at Goffstown, which is in New Hampshire, a horse skull and some old shoes were found underneath the back of an old shop. And uh, we know that the concealment of individual pieces of footwear is often associated with warding off evil. And so the horse skull being found with it kind of, you know, each sort of supports the other, that there's some kind of averting evil uh, purpose going on here. And um, the owner of that um, shop actually was convinced that the skull had protected his store from several fires which had affected the property over the years. There was a couple of, um, in that particular town, there were a couple of fires that pretty much took down whole rows of buildings um, in that town. Um, and that shop just survived and survived and survived, and they think it's because of the presence of the horse skull. And then um, a really good example from South Deerfield in Massachusetts at the Bryant Homestead, which was built in 1776. The horse skull was discovered in a thick wall near the chimney. <clears throat> and the finders of the horse skull, um, who were called Rocky and Kathy Foley, reported that when they removed it from the wall, they discovered a piece of paper in the eye socket which read, um, in quotes, Colonel David M. Bryant and family took possession of this farm on April 29th, 1848. And the note then listed the names of his wife and six children, um, which to me looks very clearly like they wanted the horse skull to protect those named in the note. But also, you know, you could say that it's kind of like um, almost like an offering at the acquisition of the building as well. But, you know, I would say def definitely that the idea was that those named in the note were uh, thought to the object of some sort of form of protection. 
I'm just going to show you a picture um, of <clears throat> some of the horse skulls that have been found in, um, in Ireland. And again, these ones, they were set into the earth beneath um, a building. This is an archaeological site. There was two, I think, I believe there were two separate sites actually in, in this one archaeological site where they found horse skulls. And you can see that, again, they're not attached to any structure. They were basically collected together under the house <clears throat> and, you know, not, not really buried that deep either. You know, they've just been there. They're fairly superficially on the, on the ground there. Um, so that, that again, you know, we've got this, um, that, that example, I believe in Ireland, we've got examples from the, from the 14th century. I think this particular example might be 16th century. And Port Marnock, I believe, is very close to Dublin. <clears throat> and um, I recently came across uh, another reference to, um, to horse skulls, which I've never really come across before. And so I'd be interested to hear if anybody does any, if anybody has more knowledge of um, ship archaeology or marine archaeology, you might be able to find some examples of this for me. But um, in Margaret Baker's book, The Folklore of the Sea, there's a reference to the Dutch East Indiaman Amsterdam, which wrecked near Hastings in Sussex. And it's a wreck that you can still go and visit, actually. And I know that they've got a display about it in a museum there. And um, apparently it wrecked in 1748. And apparently deep in the Orlock deck, Orlock deck um, a horse skull and a shoe last were found together, which the author of um, that book thought was um, averting, an averting evil method. And um, <clears throat> you know, Marsden, who, who was the archaeologist who excavated that boat, um, he did a book called The Wreck of the Amsterdam, and he mentions that he was puzzled by the discovery of um, an animal skull um, in that particular location, which kind of backs up what she said. So again, you know, this idea that, um, you know, obviously sailors were incredibly superstitious. There's a huge amount of um, folklore related to um, ships and sailing. And it looks like they also felt the value of a horse skull. And, you know, it didn't stop that particular boat from wrecking, unfortunately, but, um, but it was very close, to, very close to the uh, coast of, when it happened, which I suppose is what most wrecks do, isn't it, I suppose. I'll shut up about that because other people know a lot more about marine archaeology than I do. Um, <clears throat> so when we're looking at this, um, this topic of con concealed horse skulls, I think um, you know, we've done a bit of chat about these two theories, the foundation sacrifice theory, the acoustic theory, um, and also some of the evidence that suggests that they were there to basically ward off evil and witchcraft in a more general way as well, which is, which is one of the, 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 the roles and functions that we associate with all these other forms of apotropaic magic, like the, the symbols, the shoes, the witch bottles, the cats, you know, there's quite clear evidence that all of those did those things. The horse skulls, there's this kind of slightly more ancient element to it, you know, because there are these practices of concealing the entire animal, which go way back. And, um, and also just like the ancient mythology and folklore related to the horse as well. And the fact that many of them are found in the ground, you know, all, I mean, I've been mentioning, you know, you find them from being in the ground all the way up to being up in the roof. And the foundation sacrifice, Thing that we keep talking about um it does still occur um only about well in fact it would have been in 2018 i was shown a video which um was from a, a friend who's half albanian and she'd been sent a video showing um, a foundation sacrifice occurring in albania in that year in 2018 and what you could see was a building site um you could see concrete foundations that had been poured you can see ironwork sticking out of it, ready for a second pour over the top. And this poor little goat had been taken to this foundation that was stood there amongst the ironwork. And they basically cut its throat on, on that foundation. This was all viewed from quite far away. Thankfully, it wasn't too gory or distressing. I mean, it was still pretty distressing. But yeah, this goat was killed on this foundation and, and it was just allowed to bleed out on, on that foundation. And they, they left it there and then began the second pour. So that is an example of foundation sacrifice still occurring. And things like that definitely um, continued in the British Isles as well, right up until at least the turn of the 20th century. Um, so yeah, foundation sacrifice is a thing, but um, as you can see in the, in the, the image on the screen now, um, when you take a horse's head away from the body, the sacrifice is already, you know, there is, there's no sacrifice because you're already, the, the, the horse died somewhere else. So you're not sacrificing an animal on a site, you're taking part of an animal, and almost substituting it, you know, it's a substitute for a foundation sacrifice. And also, in many of these cases, there are many of them. And I don't think you would need that if you were actually doing a foundation sacrifice. 
yeah so i think there's, there are certain oddities about this um that we need to explore still my feeling is that um the association with the horse girl was more about warding off evil and the more horses you had the more evil you would ward off you know the more secure your place was or maybe the more it's maybe it's just proof that you were really really scared of witchcraft or bad things happening and this was um, a sign or a symbol of your efforts to keep it away so um yeah there's there's all sorts of things here i mean even you know <clears throat> i think that when we look at the uh, meaning of horse burials from earlier times like within within viking culture for example or in iron age culture you know i'm not knowledgeable enough about viking culture to talk authoritatively about that because there are some well-known sort of folkloric associations with the horse um, and sort of burial practices that they were well aware of that they worked on which is slightly different i think to the examples that i'm showing you today which are these horse skull burials so horse skulls um apart from being concealed in buildings you all know that they also occur in folk dance and guising and um one of the earliest references that I've come across um, about that was actually from the seventh century. Um, St. Aldhelm, who was apparently abbot of Malmesbury, he apparently castigated the people of Wessex who would run about in the shape of beasts. Long ago, horses and stags were worshipped in temples in crude stupidity among the impious, he said. And um, in other words, um, you know, basically masking, you know, dressing up as animals a, or as a horse or a stag was quite common at that time. And obviously, we've got things like the um, Oh, I'm just trying to remember the, the name of the tradition, you know, the, the Abbot's Bromley Horn Dance and things like that, which um, do actually go back a long way, and where we've got evidence that those um, antlers come back from a very long time ago. Um, we need to also think about um, just some, of, some of the practicalities, you know, I mean, um, if you're going to conceal a horse skull under your building or use one in a folk dance, you've got to go to some, some work or someone has to do quite a bit of work to get it into a state where you can actually use it in that way. Um, you know, a, a horse's head is one thing and a horse's skull is another. There's a, there's a process to turn it into just a skull that's clean and usable in the ways that we find them. Um, so, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of odd when you think about how much work must go into it because you have to boil a horse, you know, after defleshing it and removing all the bits and bobs inside a horse's head. You've got to boil it for quite a long time before it's clean enough to be used in a sort of non-smelly way. But yeah, you know, you think about, um, you know, how much effort it would go to to say, say, if you wanted twenty-four horse skulls, like in the example we mentioned earlier from the Portway, um, you've got to send someone to go and get twenty-four horse skulls, which means someone has to get twenty-four horses' heads and deflesh them all and boil them all, and dry them all, and present them back to you. So that you can then have them all screwed to the underside of your floor in a way that doesn't distress all of the locals in the area or rouse suspicion amongst the local priesthood. It's a, it's a crazy amount of work, really. And, and I think it's a testament to how much belief there was, you know. And um, when you when you look at um, a much more basic tradition, such as the uh, the horseshoe for luck above the door, um, I think there's all sorts of things that suggest to me that it wasn't originally just for luck. That it was actually for warding off evil. I mean, they're placed at thresholds, they're made of iron, you know, and they come from, they're used by horses. And you think about horses, they are shod with iron. You know, there's these incredible, powerful creatures that are benevolent to us humans. They work with us, they're our friends in a way. And, um, and also, you know, you think about the nature of a horse, they are incredibly sensitive. It's thought that they, well, it's known rather that they can sleep with their eyes open and standing up. So although they can they can choose to lie down and have a nice restful sleep, they can also sleep with their eyes open, which leads to this impression that they are sort of incredibly vigilant. So they could be essentially kind of like spirit guardians, if you like, of your house, if you could harness their power in some way in your house. And again, this idea that they're shod with iron, you know, iron wards off witchcraft, it wards off um, potentially harmful effects of the fairy as well. Um, <clears throat> and horse shoes are used really commonly in overt ways and horse skulls are used evidently really commonly but in more secret ways and so when the horse skull crops up in dance like you know we were talking about obviously deers with the um, abbot's Bromley horn dance but in the mary lewid um, or the hooden horse and there's also soul caking in cheshire and um, there's all these other traditions which are really really interesting so and then there are people who are bringing sort of doing modern reinterpretations of the mary lewid as well 
Um, some of you may have come across John and Susan Exton at um, some sort of folklore events. And they uh, retired art teachers who took an extreme interest in the Mary Lewis and have acquired some horse skulls. And they've got two which they regularly take to fairs and festivals. Um, this is Mary's soul, I believe. And I can't remember the name for all of them, but they're beautiful looking things. And they operate and they've got special mechanisms inside so they can open the jaws and cut the jaws. And uh, there's also a black one as well, which is the one that John normally uses. But they both have outings and they've got more than more than two anyway, they've got several. And um, <clears throat> they're impressive looking beasts um, and there is a presence about them for sure when they're, when they're in use. And um, some of you may know that in some of the earliest accounts of the Mary Lewis as well, there is um, often an element of sweeping of the hearth which takes place. And um, you, know, you think about the hearth, it's always open to the sky. It's the most vulnerable point in your building. You know, if, you, if, you've, if you're lying asleep at night, the place where evil can come in is through the chimney. And this idea that the Mary Lewis sweeps through the village, possibly frightening away, frightening away lesser spirits and evil. And there's this sweeping of the hearth, this kind of ritual cleansing, if you like, of the hearth. It's very interesting. And then some of these other sort of folk traditions um, include sort of representations of the horse's head rather than the horse's head. But again, you've got to assume that some of the same beliefs about horses um, were at work here. You know, so this is the soul caking. Um, thank Rob Gandhi for this image. I think, I think Rob is watching, so that's hi Rob. And, um, and then also um, the hood and horse. You can see we've got a much more basic type of um, horse's head depiction here. And this is from the southeast of England. Um, and I would very much recommend that book, which I've put the reference to at the top of that picture. It's uh, well worth a read. It's very, very, very interesting. So, um, so yeah, I mean, <clears throat> almost inevitably, I've forgotten to say something about horse skulls, but hopefully questions will reveal anything that I've missed. But I would sort of sum, sum up a lot of these beliefs really by saying that horses are powerful and beautiful creatures, obviously. Their defleshed horse skulls have an intimidating and otherworldly quality. Horses figure strongly in folklore and mythology around the world, even responsible for towing the chariot of the sun across the sky. Um, they're often involved um, in myths and legends about the transit of the dead from this world to the next. And, um, and so to me, it seems only natural that they could sit as silent guardians within buildings, you know, always awake with their eyes open all the time. When you're asleep, they're awake, they've got their eyes open. And, um, and they'll be protecting you against supernatural threats. Because I think that um, when you look at a defleshed horse skull, um, it could basically serve as something that would scare away lesser spirits as well. And um, you know, in the early modern period, and certainly well into the 19th century, and probably almost certainly into the early 20th century as well, this was one of the tools that people used to protect themselves against evil, to protect their homes. And um, with that, I will conclude my lecture. So thank you very much for listening. Um.